Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I Hi. apologize for my voice today. Uh, I did a lot of talking yesterday and talking loud <laughs> because uh, that's one of the reasons we come to the conferences, right? Uh, but I hope we'll make it. And we have to cover a lot today. So first of all, today we will talk about algorithms and uh, how they help to solve high load problems. In some kinds of problems that you cannot solve uh, traditionally, like uh, by scaling your servers horizontally. And then we will talk about performance tuning, how you can achieve even more high load and survive at your server side. And we will tell all of this on a case study of one small but legendary project for our team, uh, which has been in, in the works for years. And also, this is a critical part of natural language processing, such as uh, machine translation pipelines. Uh, Let's is anyone, is anyone participating in the technical challenge right now at DevOps, Grammarly Tech Challenge? So these people who participate, in 10 minutes you will uh, see how we grade the results, how we grade your scores. Dima, I think you forgot something. Let's introduce ourselves. Yeah, it happens, yeah. My name is Dima. I'm Yarek. Yeah, we work at Grammarly. And let's uh, very quickly see what we are doing and what problem we are trying to solve. In the world, there are billions of people who write in English because it's their native language or Maybe it's a language for their business communication. And uh, Grammarly is a writing application that helps people to write correctly, uh, express their thoughts clearly, and in general achieve their goals. And for that, you need to install Grammarly plugin. And we have plugins for all major browsers. We have a plugin for Microsoft Word and Outlook. And recently, we have released integration with Google Docs, a huge challenging project for us. And uh, also, for example, we have uh, mobile keyboards, which you can, can install instead of the default keyboard on your iOS or Android device. And uh, let's, let's, let's check who, who have ever used Grammarly. Wow. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ma many people in the room, but uh, some still don't use it. So for those who don't use it, uh, hear how this assistant looks in your Gmail, for example. Uh, and for us, as backend developers, uh, the important thing is that uh, Grammarly is a client-server application. So we need servers to process texts. And uh, we have quite a big load on those servers. Uh, in fact, uh, right now we have 15 million daily active users. And many of them are here in the room. <laughs> and uh, Some of them. Some. Some. You, you all contribute. Uh, to the load, and we receive and process millions of words per second across different uh, checking backends. And uh, for that, we will need a lot of servers. So very important point on the map is here. It's North Virginia, where data centers of AWS Be are located. Besides Kiev, because we are originally from Kiev, and our biggest office is in Kiev. Exactly, and the biggest engineering team. Uh, so let's see what these servers are doing. They are doing tons of different things, but let's see it just one example. So imagine someone writes uh, a message, and uh, there is a sad mistake here. Or oh, don't you think it's, it's a funny mistake? No. This is an embarrassing, embarrassing mistake. Someone confused beer with beer. And uh, how we can help this person not to make such mistakes. Uh, all algorithms do more or less similar steps. First of all, you need to find a target word which has a mistake. And it can be actually any of those words. Then you need to generate candidates, how this word can be replaced. And you can replace bear with beer, peer, fear, near, and uh, hundreds of words, actually. And uh, this is itself an interesting algorithmic problem, which has different solutions of different time and space complexity. But let's not stop here. Uh, 
after we have all those candidates, we need to choose the best uh, work of those candidates, which fits the context. And how humans could do this, probably? Uh, just Google. And I bet like everyone does this from time to time, if you are not sure how to write something. And you see that some phrases are much, much more frequent on yeah. the internet. The trick is that you need to put quotes. Yeah, yeah, phrase search. And uh, in general, in natural language processing, this is a very valuable statistics. How frequently some phrase is, uh, uh, happens, occurs in English, in English texts. And uh, these uh, phrases and corresponding frequencies are called engrams, and you can build a model of English language out of them. Uh, but, okay, can we use uh, Google in our systems? Probably not, because as I told, uh, we process millions of words per second, and we need to evaluate many candidates for each word, so it's like tens of millions of requests, uh, of similar requests. Uh, Google will immediately ban us if we try to use it. And uh, probably we cannot use also Elasticsearch or some uh, Cassandra, for example, because they are not suited for uh, this uh, like type of query of tens of millions of queries per second. And also it would be really impractical. Maybe it will cost too much for us. So uh, looks like we need to come up with our own server. Yeah, and it's a great example of the task that our teams face from day to day when uh, we start from, from the whiteboard, when we start from just blank piece of paper and all we have is just uh, a task that we need to solve from our own, from scratch. And, uh, but this task is looks uh, really a lot like uh, algorithmic interview. I, I think a lot of you have been ever to, to an algorithmic interview on one side, on another. So you probably seen something like that. You have input, which is a list of the words. Like Dima mentioned, they are called engrams. And the output that is needed to, to be produced is, is frequency of this list of words in natural language text. But this task has a very interesting uh, feature because uh, all possible inputs and all possible outputs are known beforehand. We can take a lots of and uh, lots of English texts from the internet or elsewhere and calculate frequencies for all of them. So the task really is to uh, look through the list of all possible inputs and find the output. That's all. And I think uh, like everyone in this audience already have some kind of solution, and me as well, obviously. This solution, uh, the first solution I have is called hash map, and it's just three lines of code. You need to define hash map, you need to take uh, a frequency from that, and you need to output it. And that's all, it works. Uh, hold on. I think you forgot one important question that people forget to ask. Yeah, people forget to ask it in everyday work and uh, often in interviews as well. So usually the task uh, is not the only input and output, but also some limitations. Yeah, so what are the limitations for our task? Uh, this is a good question to always to ask. And we have very hard limitations uh, because we have very many engrams. We have huge data set. Uh, I even don't know how many engrams uh, we have at Grammarly, uh, but uh, a few years ago Google uh, released a data set of engrams and it had uh, 2 billion engrams and it took over 24 gigabytes in the compressed archive form and if you unarchive it then it has like hundreds of gigabytes of data. So yeah, the data set is huge. So if you remember uh, how hash map works, you probably guess that we need to store all these n-grams in memory. But even mo moreover, uh, what happens when we uh, try to put some n-gram in hash map? It's another one 
very popular and some kind of hated question for algorithmic interview. I love it. I love it. I know I, I how don't this map works. I don't. So when some request comes up to put or to get key into the hash map, we need to find a place in some array where the entry is located. And we use some special function, which is called hash function, uh, to, to find this place and to take frequency from, from the array. But what happens with hash map very often is collisions. When same keys results in this, uh, different keys results in the same hash function value. And you need to uh, support this collision somehow. And usually it's implemented with the help of link at least. So to resolve collision, you need to s check the keys uh, if this, uh, to go all through all this list and to check where is actually your key is stored. And you need to add some additional data structures like links between those lists and more and more. And more. So uh, I think we can immediately bind this solution. Keep it in mind, but, but we cannot yeah. release it. Maybe you have heard about uh, other variants of hash map like linear addressing, linear probing hash maps, which have only arrays, but still you need to keep the keys in your hash map to resolve collisions. And as we have like hundreds of gigabytes of keys, uh, this probably does not work for us. Okay, introduction is done. And I uh, hope now we will move quicker because now something really interesting will happen. So another uh, common approach for uh, such kind of tasks is just to apply binary search. So we have, as you remember, all the data beforehand and what if we just sort it and then put it into just array, all inputs, all outputs. And when you receive a request, all you need to do is just to perform binary search in this array. So this is uh, not one operation, but uh, logarithmic, I, I think, is okay for us. Yeah, but it looks like you still need to uh, have all the, the keys in place in this array. So it's better because it's just one big array. It's very convenient to work with it in memory or on disk, but still. You don't need to uh, maintain any additional data structure like links, but you need to keep all keys and all frequencies still. But I already have an idea how we can Im improve it. So you can imagine so that each English word is uh, used in many engrams. I and uh, why do we need to store all English words? We can store, we can encode them somehow, for example, in integers and put this all the words and corresponding integers into another array. And if we sort this array, we can use another binary search to encode our request and to have uh, and to search just for numbers, not strings, which is much uh, more uh, memory efficient and even time efficient. Uh, yeah, so it looks like after we replace uh, words with numbers, we have less data, but uh, is it really the best thing we can do here? You know that I already have one more idea. You see the slides, yeah. <laughs> so uh, imagine what possible engrams can we find in, in our data set. So it can be some bear or wine, some bear or wolf, which is much more frequent one, some bear or wine, some bear or bear. And this infographic may already help you to, to improve our solution. So you see that, that a lot of engrams have common, common prefix and uh, yeah, you remember that we already replaced them with numbers. Uh, words was just for convenience. So what if we take this common prefix and encode it into another integer? In this case, we can replace these numbers into this one. Yeah, it looks like we work here like a primitive archive system, like a compression system. So we replace repetitive strings with some encoding and then the data becomes less in volume. And if we put all these tree grams into s another sorted array, we can uh, use binary search one more time. Oh, so let me go yeah, step uh, by step. And the uh, scheme is really complex now. Let's try to concentrate and repeat it one more time. What happens when we receive such a request? Yeah, so we, for such a request, a uh, string of words, we need to return a number how frequently it appears in English. So first of all, we need to replace the words with uh, the number encoding. So we use 
and the binary search in the first array for that. And then we have uh, converted it to numbers. And then we uh, have the prefix. Uh, and we can replace the prefix with the encoding we have for this prefix. And for that, we use uh, the search in the second array. Again, a binary search. And then we have uh, our new uh, key of just two numbers. Uh, two numbers are less than four numbers. Uh, I think you agree. And then we do the search in our huge, huge, huge array. Again, binary search. And we find the string is uh, in the uh, final array. So we have like lots of binary searches. We ended up in some really weird combination of three binary searches, primitive encoding, even something similar to prefix trees, but it's so uh, geeky that I like it, really. And yeah, and, and it's actually, we don't make it up. It's actually a production version. It's like advertised version how you should work with such requests. So it, it, it really works well. What benefits it has? First of first and main benefit that, yeah, it really works. We managed to put all the uh, large engrams data set into the memory. It works with acceptable latency. And uh, moreover, we do not need any like complex data structures, just three arrays of integers and that's all. Okay. But there are a problem. Uh, if you still remember the first solution, this uh, hash map, it has really great benefit. I all you need to do with the key to find where its frequency is located is to apply one hash function. So one operation, and you know where the key is located, uh, where the frequency is located. Yes, collisions were possible, but uh, imagine what if we found such a perfect hash function where which still in one operation can uh, place you in where the frequency is located. But on the other hand, it produces no uh, collisions at all. And our team, in such uh, desperate dreaming situations, we have just two options. To go to drink a coffee together is one. And another is go to the library, take this famous Celera's book, O'Corman, which is always famous name. Uh, first time we took it actually off the shelf, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Have everyone uh, ever read it? <laughs> wow. wow, great. So uh, the cool thing is that this book, it actually has an the chapter which is called Perfect Hashing, which is uh, just by name is something that we need. And another thing is that this perfect hashing, it has only one requirement for implementation. You need to know all the keys that you need to hash before you make your map with this hash. And if you still remember, it's exactly our case. We have all the keys, we have all the frequencies, and now we will try to learn together using this book and us as mediators how to build such a perfect hash. So we will take keys from uh, engram list one by one, and uh, for each such a key, we will try to place it into the large array. Uh, we will try to place the frequency of this key. And how we will use, uh, how we will find this place? We will use uh, one special hash function, which is called murmur. Have ever uh, anyone use it or know about it? Oh, I uh, think it's, uh, it's quite okay. popular hash function, and it has uh, it's like similar to hash standard hash functions in Java. It also does a lot of shuffling of the input that you do to produce some number of bits, uh, and it has one difference. Is this function? It takes not only the key but also some special seed value. You see, in this case, it's we use zero. But how we can determine which seed value to use? We will use another array, much smaller size, like probably 20 times smaller, where we place all the seed values. But how can we find which seed value to use in each particular case? We will use the same Murmur 
hash function, but with fixed seed value. Let's use zero because zero is really cool number. Yeah, okay, let me go uh, about this step by step again. So uh, we have again our input string and we move more is with uh, seed zero and then we appear somewhere in the first array and we take uh, the value from it, which is also zero and we move more our string again with this value, which is zero, and we appear somewhere in the uh, large array which has our frequencies and we return our result. But why such complication with two arrays? You, you, you understand in a, in a minute why we need two steps. So we place key by key, key by key, and obviously at some time uh, we will end up in a situation where collision really happens because uh, some value will end it up in the place which is already uh, occupied. But using these two steps, what we can do? We can just change the value of the seed in the first array and repackage all the values that uh, uses this seed. So we can try one combination, another, and more, and more, and more, and more, until we find a combination which will produce no collisions at all. Yeah, and uh, uh, the good thing is that it will converge, so it will end before the universe dies, as you probably attended the <laughs> yesterday lecture about physics and cosmology. You might worry about the universe, but don't worry about this algorithm because it will, it's guaranteed, theoretically guaranteed to converge, and uh, it will happen in a few days probably. Yeah, CLRS promised it us, and we tried, and in one week we found this perfect hash function. But uh, it's still not solved fully. We have a task with a star. Yeah, so I want to ask this, and you will think for a second about this. Uh, so what will happen if we try to search, to look up some string of words which did not exist in our data set? So we have not seen it before. Yeah, this is a code to that may help you. Yeah, so let me now go uh, and uh, check the step by step. So we send some new words to the string, we move more with zero, appear somewhere in the first array. Then we take the seed from this array, again move more it with our string, appear in some cell in our, and return some result, yeah. which is 28. But it, this is just wrong, wrong result. Prob we return zero. Probably you notice that we do not store the keys in the array of frequencies, just frequencies, which is really cool feature of this algorithm because we save a lot of memory because we do not store uh, the strings at all, even encoded. But it may lead up to such situations when we just return the frequency of another n ground. And uh, uh, there was no collision when there was no collision when we build it because we do not know that such n ground may exist. But there is a very simple solution that can fix it. So why don't we just uh, store not only frequencies, but some kind of checks checksums. And for two different values, uh, the uh, collision is really rare. So one, just one integer may be enough to resolve all the collisions. And uh, happily for, for the checksum, we can use just more more one more time. So where we ended up, we combined both best features from the first solution and from the second solution. We have just three arrays of integers and it's really memory efficient. And moreover, we have a very simple algorithm. Just not three lines of code, but three hash functions and you're done. We can implement it in half of a day and for another half of a day, the release will happen, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Or we'll go for coffee. So uh, now uh, the first takeaway is that uh, now you know about perfect caching and not many people know about it. So you learn something really uh, powerful and uh, surprising. And uh, for us, this means that we can build a simple server of these several lines of code. And we build it in Java. And the most interesting question is how should we operate w in Java with such big arrays which have uh, tens of gigabytes of data. And uh, the common technique for this in Java is off-heap uh, memory. 
So we uh, have these arrays in files on disk and we load it using operating system memory mapped files into memory. And then from Java we access uh, these files using unsafe operations and uh, it works like uh, they are already in memory and you just have access to huge array. It works and until Java 10 is released or 9, I, I don't remember. Uh, we have Java 10, it works still. Uh, uh, so the question, uh, how do we connect to this server? So we use very simple TCP socket, uh, just open TCP connection and start sending strings and in return we receive numbers. Uh, we deploy this server on AWS. As uh, I said, we uh, need uh, tens of gigabytes of memory maybe even hundreds, so we use uh, memory optimized instances which uh, have extra memory. And uh, just a couple of such instances on Amazon, they can handle uh, uh, millions of requests per second, especially if we send the engrams in batch, like 100, 200 engrams in batch together and receive a batch of numbers. And uh, this works really well for us for some time uh, until we get more users and more queries. And uh, the latency just just rises a little bit, a little. And we have uh, like cascading failure on all other clients of this system. And we receive alerts. And what should we do? My suggestion is to add more servers and go for a coffee. Uh, okay, yeah, let's add servers because Amazon has many servers. And uh, yeah, it works, we always do that. And then we have more users again and we scaled not only servers but we sc scaled also fires in production. And then some other people come to us and say, uh, well, uh, your server is just kind of convoluted hash map. Why is it even slow? And uh, here the story about performance debugging begins. And in our team we have uh, found several approaches to performance debugging which work for us. And the first approach is uh, do a random guess uh, and oh yeah it's Java slow or you need to increase TCP buffer in Linux or like you need to switch to EPOL uh, and uh, in general you will not guess correctly and this is an anti-pattern but everyone starts with uh, this when they start performance tuning. Uh, the better approach is benchmarking. Uh, you create a load test and you put your system under the load and you try to like load until it breaks it, until it cannot sustain more load. And there is a very important thing here. You must look at what resource is saturated, why it cannot handle more load. Because if you don't look, you will jump to some wrong conclusion and it will be the random guess again. And I will see you later why. And uh, also, the third approach is just to launch all the tools that you know or might have heard about in your operating system and just to look what these tools show to you and maybe uh, something will give you a hint what's wrong. And uh, I have a very important disclaimer about performance benchmarking as we approach some uh, benchmarking of different systems. Uh, it's a very common situation when you uh, launch a server, you uh, run a load test and you observe that the system is like significantly slower than usual and immediately someone clever comes to you and says, okay, yeah, I know why. But the interesting thing, the next day you run the same server on the same load test and this does not reproduce anymore. So why is this? Uh, of, of course, because you run on AWS or maybe in other cloud environment and uh, uh, of course, like you don't have a dedicated server, most likely run on virtual machine and there are virtual machines of different users which run on the same physical uh, server uh, together and you cannot control that and you cannot control network congestion or uh, I don't know, other conditions, weather in, in North Virginia is bad that day. So there is a significant performance variability when you benchmark, especially in your cloud. And there are different ways how you can fight with it, like uh, do statistical analysis, run many, uh, your test many times on different virtual machines, uh, A-B testing, or maybe you should 
uh, measure not only requests per second. You or maybe you can go for a coffee one more time. Or well if you don't want, let's just develop new features, not but not this. Yes. So let's not let's not do all of this. And we just need to accept the fact that your performance variability is like 10% by chance. Uh, that also is important to know. And as long as I'm talking about a uh, data center, uh, here is a typical stack of your data center in the cloud uh, with which you work. Uh, and on top of it is your application and your runtime environment. And here is where most performance gains happen. Uh, because uh, you, for example, can write your server not in Java, but in uh, Golang or Rust, or you can use a better algorithm for your task. But in this case, the perfect hashing is called perfect for reason. We do not have We, we are set with uh, algorithms, but uh, let's uh, face the truth. Like We have been developing this server for like two days, and it's probably not as optimized as Nginx. So there is a lot to work on. Below your server is the operating system which you run in your virtual uh, virtual uh, environment in your cloud. And probably you cannot gain a lot here, uh, but here are most of the tools which were mentioned previously, which you can uh, debug your performance. And below is the level of hypervisor and the uh, hardware in your cloud data center. And you don't have access to it uh, but here happen most of the innovations. And uh, I just want to tell an example of such innovation which we uh, used. So immediately after we switched to ENA on Amazon, we received plus 30% of performance one improvement. One moment. Let's ask who knows what ENA is. You need oh to explain. Oh, oh I, I, I definitely need to explain then. Uh, so ENA stands for Elastic Network Adapter. And what is it? So when you launch your virtual machine, it must communicate over the network somehow with other services. So it has to have a network interface. And ENA is Elastic Network Interface, which is a technology of Amazon. Uh, and uh, what it has, so it's like a network card which is uh, virtualized, which has multiple queues. And each queue receives uh, the packets from the network. And then each queue you can map to a buffer in your operating system memory. And it will send those packets directly. And the operating system will pull them. And you can assign a separate core to every of the buffers. And uh, then uh, it will pull it faster. And you will have less jitter, less latency. And this is called received side scaling. And I want to very quickly say that this thing is really awesome and fascinating. It's not very new, but it's fascinating to think oh, why it even works. Because if you remember about operating systems, they work with virtual memory, which they map to some uh, pages in physical memory of your computer by memory management unit and some caches and operating system support. But here we run on the virtual machine. So you map from a, a virtual instance to the uh, host operating system. But host operating system runs with many virtual machines. And then it, there is a double map. OK, Dima, it's really a fascinating thing, but probably hard to catch. So uh, we have links in the end of the slides about everything that we are speaking today, about algorithm, about ENA, about AWS, and more and more you will see. Thank you. Uh, OK, but once we talked about virtualization, here is a picture from the blog of Brandon Gregg, who is the expert in systems performance. You, sh you should explain why red is bad and what is green. Yes, red is bad, uh, green is good. And uh, this shows the evolution of uh, virtualization on AWS. And uh, just a year ago, they have released a new hypervisor called Nitro, uh, which has green. So it has near bare metal performance for all resources of the server, like CPU or network or interrupts. And uh, just after switching to the Nitro generation, to the C5, M5 instances on Amazon, we received another 30% increase 
in our request per second. And also those instances are cheaper than the previous generation. So it's very important to uh, read the blogs of your cloud provider and uh, like uh, be interested in any news that they bring to you. Okay, we have a question now. So I told that we launch on memory optimized instances and uh, for example, it has 16 cores, but we also can on launch on a general purpose instance with 20 cores. And same amount of memory. Yeah, and it will be slower for us like significantly, so not, not even faster, but rather slower. Why? Anyone can guess why? Uh, contention? No, 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 we parallelize really well here. Uh, Laura? DynamoDB. Yeah, uh, okay, so this was a hard question. Uh, it's because that instance is NUMA instance. And what NUMA is? So all modern servers are NUMA, and if you launch a big server, it will be also NUMA. And NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. So how it works? So on a big server, there are several sockets. And in each socket, there is a separate processor. That's how they scale. And on every processor, there are different, uh, many cores. And they can be virtual cores, like hyper-threading. But they cannot communicate through the same memory bus. Because then the memory bus becomes the point of contention, the bottleneck. So each processor is connected directly to a part of memory, like one memory node. And then they can still access uh, the other m memory nodes uh, by doing some hops over the interconnect, but it is slower. And in our case, it's just what happens. So we launch our huge server, and it occupies one memory node, but we want to utilize all processors, so the other processors will be slow. And the operating system tries really hard to fix it for us. They are NUMA optimized, by the way, like Linux. So they will either try to balance your schedule, your threads to run on the same physical processor closer to memory, or otherwise they will try to move your memory pages physically to where the uh, threads are scheduled, but this does not help in our case, and we have seen many cases when uh, something is slow because of NUMA if you launch a huge instance. So in the end of the slides, we have more links so you can learn how to debug these questions. And uh, yeah, you must really remember about that. Okay, let's now talk about th the top of our stack, the Java performance. At this point of time, uh, many people were involved in this project and some are really uh, fond of C++, and they come to us and say, okay, so your Java is slow. We should rewrite it in C++. And other people <laughs> say, no, 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 Java is not slow. You just need to tune it more correctly. And as you remember, we do everything by random guess at first. So we decide to tune by the Java TCP server, which we have, if you remember. There are several ways how to write a TCP server. First is uh, the very old school way uh, to run one thread per one TCP connection. It existed like for decades. Then uh, people came and said, so we need to run millions of uh, uh, TCP connections at one server. So they invented uh, IO multiplexing, uh, EPOL uh, in Linux, and uh, in Java it's uh, the Neo package in the standard library. And uh, also, there is Netty. Netty, uh, who knows, who uses Netty actually? Uh, those who did not uh, raise hand, probably you still use Netty, but you don't know about that. Uh, because the Netty is a default uh, library for networking, so it's uh, used in Cassandra, in RxNet, in Vertex, in many, many other Java projects. And it's really heavily optimized, like using GNI, for example. It has another approach on non-blocking I.O. So, and uh, of course, we decided to rewrite uh, our server with Netty. It's all good. So who thinks the server becomes faster after that? Yeah, some people think. Who thinks that uh, thread per connection is still like the best in 2018? Uh, 
Uh, same people. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. So for us, for us, no difference. No difference at all. Uh, why? Because we don't uh, have millions of in, in common connections. We actually open long living connections, maybe a couple of hundreds, and then use them for a couple of minutes. And uh, it does not matter on the modern hardware and modern Linux optimized for such use case. And we have a link about that uh, of one uh, blogger who recently tested this as well. Uh, so if we s fail so miserably with Netty, uh, But we have one more, one more solution. <laughs> we, let's take a look what our server is actually doing under the load. And again, uh, who knows what this uh, tool is? Shut out. It's a dstat, dstat tool. Uh, very nice interface, very convenient tool. So we see here that under the load, our system uh, spends most time in user space, in doing something useful for us. And also we have uh, a fraction of time in system uh, uh, kernel and uh, in the deferred uh, interrupts uh, because we have to process network packets using all those uh, receive side scaling processors, as I said. But we do something useful, and how we can look in our Java application and see what we're doing. And there is a very good tool called Async Profiler, uh, which you can find on GitHub. You know, I, I think it's this slide is not readable at all from the distance. Can you improve it? OK, I'm improving it. So Async Profiler, and uh, in, in just three minutes, uh, Believe me, in three minutes, uh, you can build a flame graph using this tool. And flame graph is an awesome visualization of what your program is doing in the call stack, so where it spends time. And we see, like, below there is a, a long stack of native uh, functions, but we don't uh, waste any time there. And where we waste our time? Here, 30% in the perfect hash function. And, uh, we could expect that because all our server is doing is calculating those hashes, as we told you. So we are some kind of crypto farm. Yeah, and we, we don't uh, get richer by that, but we calculate many hashes. And uh, it's good that we now know we need to optimize this. So flame graphs are really awesome, awesome tool. <laughs> okay. Now same people come to us again and say now uh, your hash function is slow and it's uh, no time to wait anymore. We are rewriting this in C++. And really the server is slow and in C++ there are also good networking libraries like Boost, ASIO for example, uh, or thread per connection always works as you see. And uh, okay, who thinks that after rewriting C++ it gets two times, two times faster? I think. Uh, no, no one. <laughs> Why, uh, you, because you there are no those C++ guys in the room. Okay, who thinks that Java matured and actually it, uh, came to a point where it is on par with C++ or maybe it, it defeats C++? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, our results were as follows. Wow, so we have like barely the same performance. So we almost like ready to open a bottle of sparkling wine. And uh, yeah, to the fact that Java became uh, such uh, performant uh, nowadays. But uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it just doesn't look right to me. So can we look inside what our C++ uh, program is doing? And yeah, I, I thought like, uh, uh, disassembling programs is hard, but again, it's very simple. So a few questions on Stack Overflow, and we have this uh, disassembly of our program, and we go directly into our uh, hash function because we know we spend most time there. So I have reducted it a bit, uh, two lines of C++ code and uh, corresponding assembly instructions. 
Uh, so what, let's see what we're doing. So we multiply k by a constant. So we move the constant into a register, we move the uh, contents of the memory into another register, we multiply those registers, and we move the result back into memory. And then we rotate left uh, k by 15 bits, and uh, again, we move something back from memory into register. Okay, uh, I think I'm on the other side, but nine lines of assembly out of two lines of C++ code is something really strange. Yeah, yeah it, it happens sometimes, but yeah, some of you get the idea already. So we uh, build the program without any uh, optimizations. Uh, so this uh, binary is very good for uh, going step by step in debugger, and you Im on every step you have your results uh, loaded from memory, saved to memory again, and you know memory is a new disk, memory is very slow in modern computers compared to CPU. So after we compile it with uh, at least some optimizations, like C1 level, voila, so here is it, multiply and rotate. And uh, now we test it again, yeah, and yeah, C++ is still faster than Java <laughs> even today. Uh, so, for the next time, uh, what we ended with. So we, I have a question. Okay, we we got a really great result, but can we do better? Maybe try another language. Maybe Graal can help us. Maybe Go, Rust, something. Yeah, who thinks Rust is faster? <laughs> uh, no, sorry, you cannot do this faster, even in Rust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably with vector instructions, but not with Rust. Yeah, so uh, we decided to stay on Java because it's not that big difference, and we don't want to fragment our stack and have different deployment pipelines, build pipelines, different expertise. So uh, Java is kind of okay if we use all those optimizations uh, which we talked before. Uh, but we managed to yeah, make a faster solution. We wanted to know how fast the server can ever be. And we made another experiment. So we uh, commented all the hash functions in our code. And we, instead of them, we just returned zero. And we put this server into test. And here are results. Yeah, here it is. So it tends time, 10 times faster. Uh, and what have we got out of this experiment? So first of all, we got very uh, fast and useless server. And uh, <laughs> secondly, we clearly see that a network is not a bottleneck in our case. So we can uh, saturate 10 gigabit network with this uh, server, which, uh, so our guess about uh, optimizing hash function is uh, proven. Yeah, that's it. And uh, as, as Dima said, we stayed with Java, but C++ was also a useful experience for us because when we started developing a Grammarly keyboard for mobile phones, for Android and for AS, uh, you can see how it works and you should in try and install it. It's really cool and really cool thing. And uh, the trick is that keyboards should work without no internet connection at all because it happens a lot when you are with your mobile phone. And it means that you we need to take all these huge 100 gigabyte servers and put it into the mobile phone. And that was only one s service we had, but we need to put many of them. And uh, iOS, Android, they are very strict. For example, iOS at some point killed all keyboards that exceeds 15, 50 meg megabytes of uh, RAM. Yeah, so you really need to use uh, algorithms again, and you need to use uh, low-level system tricks here. For example, like in mobile keyboard, uh, iOS is a Unix-like system, and uh, Android is also like Unix-like Linux uh, system. So you need a lot of tricks which we discussed, but now in your device, you, which you cannot, you cannot scale it. You cannot launch like many <laughs> mobile phones. So uh, what are the takeaways? What were the takeaways for us from this project, which 
uh, happened over the years, actually, and uh, which we can share with you. So uh, uh, if you're like a happy Java developer, you will be more happy and productive if you have algorithms and you have some low level under your belt. Uh, so actually, it's a big difference. It's not like you will have some what's faster system, or maybe your refactoring will be better. No, it's a borderline between, like, you have a working solution for a problem, maybe unseen problem, some feature or product or engineering problem, and you don't have a solution. Uh, because, like, if you have a little algorithms and uh, low-level skills like C++, assembly, uh, operating system, network uh, protocols, you can Google the rest. You can search in the Stack Overflow. It, if you have no skills, then uh, you don't know even how to Google, what to ask. You don't have any idea, and you don't even believe that something is possible. And uh, I have uh, just a small tip about algorithms, so how to learn algorithms. Uh, uh, probably you should not waste uh, too much time on classes or books, so one or two is enough. But instead, uh, you can uh, participate in the programming competitions rounds, such as top coder rounds or other competitions. And just uh, on the novice beginner level, and you can invite your friends also to participate in the same rounds and then discuss those solutions. And it is very good motivation how you can very, very quickly expand your algorithmic skills. And uh, also, I have a number of takeaways about performance and benchmarking. So first of all, don't guess. Always look inside. So for example, when we compare Java to C++, I thought that C++ is faster because it has, it's using CMD vector instructions. Uh, and Java does not. And I even started like reading about this. But when I look in the assembly, I don't see any instructions there, like vector instructions. So do not leave any assumptions unchecked. Uh, then uh, when you do a lot of testing, always check what resource is saturated. Uh, for example, I launch a huge server on Amazon and yeah, I uh, launch our application, uh, Ngrams. And uh, it does not show the performance improvement as uh, big as uh, the server is bigger. And uh, I see that my CPU is underutilized. So I can, uh, actually what, what I did. So I gave a little more room to the garbage collector. And after I see the CPU is utilized, uh, everything is okay. But some people just, just stop and say, okay, it does not work, it just uh, does not scale. No, you need to look what resource is saturated. It can be memory, disk, uh, network bandwidth. It can be garbage collector. It can be some exotic things like interrupts, for example. But yeah. Then you, as I told you, must measure variability because your results may be uh, different just by chance or by time of the day, for example. And also use these awesome tools like DSTAT or Async Profiler or Flame Graphs or many other tools. And there are blogs and uh, people who love those tools and they tell a lot about them. And that's it. We have a lot of references in the end, which you can read if you are interested in these topics. And thank you very much. Come to speak to us at our Grammarly booth. We will be uh, wrapping Let's up Let's ask the competition. Who, who have visited our booth at the conference. <laughs> Please come. come. You still have time. Almost everyone uh, from our backend team, Java team, is here. You can ask questions. We will answer them, all of them. And moreover, we have a competition, which will end in an hour, and we will present the best results. I think it will be interesting for everyone. And the last thing, we have stickers, really cool stickers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.